Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you very much for joining us uh, in this session. Uh, this is part of the track uh, related to the challenge of large data. Uh, and I'm uh, editorially making the opportunity to insert libraries into that, into that conversation. Um, <clears throat> for those of you that were at the, uh, the panel session this morning, you had the benefit of hearing some computer scientists talk about libraries. Now I thought I'd actually have some librarians talk about libraries. <laughs> um, and uh, to that end, uh, we've uh, invited um, three very esteemed uh, librarians, uh, university librarians from three different very renowned institutions in the United States. Um, first off, I would like to introduce, to come and speak to us, Paul Krant, the University Librarian at University of Michigan, to give his talk. Thanks, Lee. Um, am I on? Oh, it's terrific. I always wanted to be on. Um, I thought, actually, I'd talk about computer science. Uh, it seems only only fair. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I was raised by mathematicians, which is a little bit like being raised by wolves, uh, and they were fond of saying the science in computer science is mathematics, but we won't debate that point right now. Um, um, I couldn't judge on it. So um, uh, I really only have one message, uh, which is this. The efficient locus of much traditional library activity including provision of access to and preservation of both print and digital collections, is moving to network scale. There's always been an argument, actually, for it, and there's always been a sort of network uh, amongst the libraries long before that network was electronic. So we're moving from many instances of things to one, or to be safe, six or 11, but not 1,100 or 11,000. Um, so that's the first thing. Disintermediation which is to say that it's easy for users to do things themselves is absolutely everywhere. Uh, and that's just a fact about our world. Um, and the economies of universities and publishing have not made the adjustment to these changes, um, nor have the applicable laws and regulations that govern the publishing industry uh, and intellectual property made the appropriate adjustments to this world. And that leads us to the opportunities uh, and the challenges that libraries currently face. Um, there are lots of opportunities now for policy. There are lots of opportunities for collective action, uh, especially in the academic sector. Uh, and there are also opportunities to make really big mistakes, which is always, always makes us feel good. Um, so here's the basic puzzle that we face, one of my favorite pairs of facts around the world. Um, making and distributing copies used to be expensive, and publishers and librarians and tenure review committees were happy. This was the golden age of scholarly communication. It ended six months ago, or maybe six years. Now it's essentially costless to make and distribute copies, and everybody except for a few publishers is absolutely miserable. And um, if you actually listen to the way people talk about the world that we face, that is indeed the way they talk about it. Um, and that's a, um, that's a bit of a puzzle. Since making and distributing copies is what we do, you'd think that if it got cheap, we'd feel better um, rather, rather than worse. So um, uh, I'm going to um, argue that the difficulties of the publishing industry are very much at the heart of many of the current problems faced by libraries. Uh, it's complicated. Books are different from journals. Um, uh, and I'm mostly going to talk uh, about journals, uh, which produce profits, rather than books, which don't. Um, so, um, but, but I'll be happy in question and answer to also talk about, uh, about uh, uh, monographs, and I'll get to them a little bit um, here as well. Um, but I want to notice here that the method by which we produce texts and images and the things that we read, that we communicate with each other, 
Um, the phrase that people use is scholarly communication. I've always preferred the phrase scholarly publishing because we're making things public. But the mechanisms, the technologies by which we make things public actually matter in this instance a lot because the change to electronic production um, really does affect the way in which almost everything can be done. I also want to argue that libraries are becoming more and more like publishers. Um, the, we take stuff and we pump it out. We pump it out through nice thick fiber pipes. Um, well, the way we distribute the content digitized by Google uh, is very much, you know, that's a library function. Boy, that feels a lot like publishing. Although if I say that in a room full of publishers, they, they misinterpret my remark. We would never knowingly violate the law. Um, but whether it's us or Google, we're distributing it. We look a lot like a publisher. Uh, we're reprinting and distributing from our own collections. Um, the University of Michigan has for sale hundreds of thousands of public domain uh, volumes at nice low prices on Amazon. Um, um, the, um, uh, uh, the way in which university press, the press business and the academic journal stuff will go, again, looks a lot like what libraries do. You make a copy, you distribute it uh, out. Institutional repositories. Um, are, of, are a form of publishing. You put stuff in the institutional repository, it has an address, you can find it. See, that, gee, that feels just like a library. Oh, once you've found it, you can read it, you can print it, you can copy it, you can send it somewhere else. Gee, that feels a lot like uh, a publisher, making things publishing. So, um, so the, uh, the distribution technology, the ability to send things out over the, uh, over the internet, uh, is already there, which is a good reason for a library to, uh, to begin to act uh, more and more like a publisher. And now a lot of the, and the, and a lot of the production expertise for scholarly literature uh, already resides in the university. It never used to reside in the library so much. It was in the university press or in other places, but, uh, but it's in the university. The library is pretty good at capturing it. Mike Keller, who's going to speak after me, was one of the founders of one of the first library-based publishing operations, it's not surprising that library stuff and publishing stuff are, uh, are uh, moving, moving together. Um, and um, uh, uh, we'll get a little bit on more on that later. So here's my, I hope, second fact about the world. Maybe I'll do it this way. That seems to work better. So Thomas Jefferson, who was a very good economic theorist, um, he actually was a very good economic theorist, pretty good at almost everything, um, makes this remark, um, uh, writing a letter, uh, actually writing a letter to the person who founded the, um, the Boston Public Library, I believe. Um, but basically he says, no, actually that's a different cool letter he wrote. No, nope, he wrote this letter to somebody else. Um, but the point he's making here is that ideas are, um, are what economists call pure public goods. Uh, they're non-rival in consumption. Uh, and so the, this lovely phrase, he who receives an idea from me receives instructions himself without lessening mine, as he, he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. So we can, we can keep this light going without, without, it doesn't cost us anything to have the next person um, have access to the idea or, um, or, or, light, or light the taper. Inventions then cannot in nature be a subject of property. So he's making an ethical statement, deriving it from an economic condition. Um, the way an economist would phrase this now is, if the marginal cost of providing a good is zero, the price ought to be zero, even though we might have mechanisms to make it be more than that. This is, a, this is an ethical statement uh, about what ought to be. And it animates, I would claim, and it ought to animate the way we in the academy think about the information and the ideas and the knowledge that we generate. Right? We're not actually in it to sell bits of knowledge, not mostly. Um, we're actually in it to, um, um, to make a better and more interesting world. Okay, so um, um, the other, so now I want to go through a list of what libraries do and why they do it. Um, um, they collect, very crucially. They provide access to things. They record and display the provenance of things. A very important feature of libraries is that if you go to the library, you know where the thing you looked at came from. This is sometimes confused with 
um, uh, we say that G information that's in the library is in some way authenticated. The information that's authenticated is the metadata, not the data, right? So lots of errant nonsense in books in the library, but we know where the book came from, and that's very important. Um, we preserve over the long run, which is uh, um, something that actually no very few other institutions are interested in. And therefore, because we preserve over the long run, we provide access in the future with, pro with the provenance, sort of lather, wrench, repeat on the, uh, um, on the preceding list. Um, and, um, uh, and why do we do those things? Because scholars and scholarship require that we do those things. You have to have access to the scholarly record. You have to be able to cite it reliably. When you produce new knowledge, you have to be able to put it in the library so somebody else can find it. Uh, or at least put it in some place where somebody else can find it. Notice that scholars do not require that it be done by the library. They actually don't much care um, who does this work. Um, they might have sentimental reasons before, or for or against libraries doing it. But the functioning of the academy requires that it be done well, and the library's been doing it for, for a long time. Uh, and so if we're going to take things out of the library, we have to figure out how to get these functions performed. Uh, and uh, part of the claim that I'm going to make uh, is that especially the preservation piece um, n is no longer automatically attended to uh, in the digital age, and that that's causes all sorts of problems. Um, uh, the other thing is that having learned to do these things, libraries are generally good at providing expensive things to be, um, to be shared widely. Notice that providing expensive things to be shared widely isn't a bad working characterization of publication, right? Um, so um, they're expensive in the provision part, but the, we want to be able to share them widely. Okay, so here's what the world used to look like. That's the um, main library at the University of Michigan. That's uh, Mike's library. Um, and um, this little one on the right is the uh, library at East Carolina University, which isn't as big as us. So whoops, let's go back. Um, so what used to happen with libraries is that there was a huge difference between what you held locally and the rest of the things that you might want to have access to. So if you were right by my library, you had access to the seven and a half or so million volumes that were in there. You could borrow things on interlibrary loan from, um, from Stanford or from Purdue, or from East Carolina for that, that matter, although that would happen somewhat less often. And East Carolina in turn could borrow from us, although it would take them a fair amount of time. But basically the easy collection that one had access to at relatively low cost uh, as a scholar was the nearby collection. Here's where we're going to be. It says you are here, I ought to say you're going to be here because we're not there yet. These are the original five Google partners. Um, I shouldn't have said that word. These are the original five Bing, but it just doesn't work, you know. Uh, these are the original five Google partners. Um, and um, and uh, in the, at the point where all these collections are digitized and accessible to each other, which would require a change in legal regime, um, everybody's collections are available everywhere, which would be um, a, a very different world than the world that, uh, that we have lived in. Although we're getting close to this world for published works in the public domain, uh, and already that's beginning to make a, um, a substantial, substantial difference. Notice that even if Google had won the original lawsuit, we still wouldn't be in this picture. Um, we would have copies of the books uh, in digital form, but we would have no authority to display them. Uh, Google would have gone on displaying snippets, which would drive you nuts. Uh, and the rest of us would uh, have well-indexed search, which is really much better than nothing, but not nearly as good as being able to, uh, um, to read the book. And this causes enormous frustration already. You go to any of our catalogs, there's a little thing that says, you know, digital record, and you click on the digital record, and it turns out all you can do is basically search for strings of text. You can, you can the, the digital record is an index, but it's not a copy of the book. I just went through a long, unpleasant set of email exchanges with a young philosophy student in England who wanted to get a hold of Beasley's translation of Comte's essays published in 1903 in England, published in 1850-something by Comte. So, you know, anybody ought to be able to find that. And we wouldn't give it to him. It's in the, it's in the Hathi Trust, which holds Michigan's digitized work. 
It was published in 1903, so it ought to be in the public domain. Oops, it was published in 1903 in England. And in England, the rule is life plus 70, right? In the United States, the rule is life plus 70 or 1922 or before. So no problem in the U.S. So if you were in the U.S., actually, you could read this book online. But if you're in England, you can't read this book online. Uh, and this kid basically said, you're, you're not letting me read the book because you don't like the English. And I said, well, yeah, no, I don't like the English, not at all. But that's actually not why I'm not letting you read this book. I'm not letting you read this book because I can't. Um, and then I eventually found out that Mr. Beasley died in 1915, and I was able to make the book available to the kid, and everybody's living happily ever after. But we have that kind of frustration um, all, all the time. Uh, okay. So um, um, the Google settlement, if it went through, would give this, this kind of broad access uh, to lots of collections, and eventually the limit of the game would be that almost everything that's ever been published would be available almost everywhere. That is, so you want to talk about big data. I don't know if it's big data in terms of bits, not that big, that's mostly print, uh, but it's very big data in terms of the sweep of recorded human intellectual history. I mean, it's about what there is. Uh, and one can imagine getting there soon. And to give Google its due here in the land of Microsoft, what Google did by walking into these libraries and making the agreements and digitizing is it turned something that looked impossible into something that looks inevitable. Um, you don't actually get to do that very often in the course of a lifetime. Um, so, and I really do think that's the, that's we're now faced with the, with the inevitability at some point because it's so valuable to so many people of uh, this greatly shared uh, collection. So here's something we've done, we the library world, um, this is the logo of the Hathi Trust. Um, and um, what the Hathi Trust is doing is taking largely the Google content, but also lots of other content, and building a collective library, a digital library. Um, um, and, uh, and it is growing rapidly. So, uh, whoops, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this to happen. No, I didn't. I wanted a really nice, there's a beautiful graph here. Uh, any of you just close your eyes and visualize things rising uh, in the way that they would if this were a beautiful graph. There are now about six million volumes in the Hathi Trust. We figure there'll be about eight million by the end of the year. That's a good size library. Uh, and uh, we expect to be over 10 million within a few years. We're limited in what we can do with these works, but these works, the works in the Hathi Trust, noticed, are being held and cataloged by libraries. The, the scans aren't perfect. Most of them are Google scans, and they have the problems that those scans have had. But the holding is um, uh, that libraries are doing this for the academy uh, is, I think, um, uh, extremely important. OK. So, um, so we have this collection of collections. We can imagine these shared collections. Um, um, networks make for natural monopolies, right? The, the, the reason we have this zero marginal cost condition is because, and we have this zero, this zero marginal cost condition, so you get that, that one holder, one, one, one copy well held can be pumped out for free to the world. Holding a second copy is something you might do for security purposes, but you actually don't need it if you think it's perfectly secure. There's no sense at all for there being many hundreds uh, or many thousands of copies. Um, and this leads to, um, uh, it's, it's much less valuable for any given library now to be acquiring, uh, to be cataloging, or to be preserving. The system still requires the acquisition, the cataloging, and the preservation. It actually might not require cataloging. You might get that um, through various kinds of, of search and indexing. But no individual library gets an especially good payoff, and that causes some really serious system problems. We have to figure out how to cooperate at a better scale. Now I'm going to switch very quickly to publishing. I took longer to get here than I wanted to. Um, so the framers of the Constitution uh, granted the right, granted the right of, granted to Congress, this is in the enumerated powers in the Constitution. There's sort of 12 things that Congress can do, and one of them is it can give out copyright and patents. Uh, and it can do it because, on the one hand, the framers understood that these were public goods being pumped out at zero marginal cost. Uh, on the other hand, they understood that if you didn't pay people to do, you know, important intellectual work, they might not do it. So the idea was to grant a temporary monopoly, and that worked really well. Back in those days, the monopoly was 14 years. 
um, uh, now it's life plus 70, as we've said. This is uh, self-explanatory, um, uh, but it's the world that we've moved into. It makes just as much sense in the scholarly world as it does, as it does in kindergarten to convert um, uh, um, sharing to um, protecting intellectual property. Um, so in the old days, the way we published was we had these big printing presses, and that's where, that was the expensive piece. And you weren't going to publish stuff unless you vetted in advance that you were likely to be able to sell it. Hence, we had elaborate review, and then we'd sell it. And we'd sell the content, right? Because actually the content cost a lot to produce. There was no other way to get it. Now we have a gazillion ways of pumping the news out there. Some of them free, some of them charged. I didn't even bother to throw in bookstores. I suppose I could have. Um, but uh, there's a lot, of ways, a lot of ways to do it. The expensive part now is the network itself. And that isn't paid for by the library, by the publishing industry, um, by the university. Actually, it is paid for to some extent by the university. Um, but it's, uh, it's no longer attached to the production and distribution of the scholarly work. And that is a very big difference. Um, so. Um, some problems with, uh, with the way the current word work, world works. The economics of big deals I'm actually going to skip over because I don't have much time left. Um, the peer review and its discontents I am going to spend a moment on. So we have this system of peer review where we read things in advance and then decide whether or not to publish them. Um, that's quite sensible, actually. If you're a publisher, you'd like to know that someone might buy the thing that you're trying to sell. Although, as I said now, it's much easier to just, uh, just, just pump stuff out uh, than it used to be. We've, we've inverted it. We now use the peer review that comes from, uh, from publication as an indicator of the quality of the faculty member who produced that publication. So, um, so we make statements you know, of the form, um, um, boy, she's got three papers in nature. She must be really good. Uh, here's a thought. Let's read the papers. Uh, not just the ones that are in nature, uh, but the ones that are in other places too, and let's figure out how much impact those papers have had, not through a citation index, or through some bibliometric technique, or through the Shanghai Zhao Tung um, um, rankings, not through um, having things aggregate up to the least publishable units so that people publish in 26 papers what they used to publish in four, uh, let's actually look at the impact by reading the work and making a judgment of it. If we did that, then really the, the biggest piece that publishers claim is important, uh, that, they, that they still provide as value, the biggest piece, which is the peer review, becomes unimportant. So my, my assertion here is that we ought to think about ways uh, not of necessarily taking peer review out of publication, but of taking publication per se out of, out of peer review. Um, so here's a sort of menu of what's involved in producing scholarly work, which is fine. Um, and uh, publishers, I mean, peer review in the literal sense, being reviewed by your peers, all the things in bold require that. All the things in bold require interchange amongst peers to make judgments about quality, which is extremely important, and academic work can't proceed without it, right? But actually, only the two that are in bold here are services that publishers as such anymore have to, have to do. All the rest of it can be done uh, through a variety uh, of other mechanisms. And, the, um, and so we would, uh, uh, I would like to claim that we can, what we ought to be doing uh, in libraries and in academic publication is essentially reclaiming the industry as a, an average cost recovery, not-for-profit industry. Maybe we give, ideally, we'd pay for it in advance and give it away. Um, okay, one, uh, one thing I've left out is um, that um, there's a high, very high payoff to being able to reuse published work, uh, to be able to recombine it, and for that, you really, that's not supposed to show. That's supposed to be a blank slide. Okay, well, there it is. You can read it, so we don't have to worry about it. Um, um, scholars don't really require having this kind of openness of their data and their work to be recombined by others. They perhaps ought to, but they, they haven't, uh, which gets us into various things. One more point, this is now money. How much time have I got left? Minus two minutes? Wrap up, okay. Um, um, 
it is much more expensive to keep a print book than to keep um, uh, a, an electronic book. So we can save an enormous amount of money by going to an electronic book as being the main book of use, preserving a handful of print copies in various places around the world because they might be really important, but it's a handful rather than a thousand, right? And going from a thousand to a handful uh, at these numbers uh, is, a, is a big saving. So, so one of the ways of, of enabling a shared print collection a shared collection of collections of print is to um, start with a shared collection electronically as being the, um, the main um, use collection. And um, the thing we need to make all of these things happen, where the technical change drives us, is we want a different le legal regime. Steve Chevelle has actually argued that we should eliminate copyright for, public, for uh, scholarly work. I think that he has a very good argument. People, in, people do scholarly work because they want f fame, right? They want to be read. Getting rid of copyright makes it easier to be read, uh, not, not hard. Um, we should, if we don't get that legal regime, which we won't, um, we should have a set of norms in which we eliminate exclusive copyright for academic work because we give it away. We have a Creative Commons attribution license. Uh, is one possibility. We assert under the work for hire doctrine that the university or research institute owns the work and it grants a non-exclusive Creative Commons license you know, for in perpetuity. There are lots of ways uh, that you could do that. And I actually think this may be the moment because so many people are upset that Google might have a monopoly. This is the anti-monopoly act that the academy can uh, can engage in. And then we have to dream of have institutions that allow us to preserve print and digital works at web, at, uh, at, at galactic scale. Uh, and we don't have those institutions as yet. And if you think the government's going to be it, um, we're here to help you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'd now like to uh, to invite up uh, my other colleague, Michael Keller. And we'll pull up his slide here. Is this remote? And uh, Michael is the university librarian at Stanford University, as well as publisher of Highwire Press, a very influential press in the academic world. Over to you, Michael. So a uh, little change of pace. Whoops, forward. There we go. Uh, taking a look at what's out there uh, that I know is in development, you know is in development, maybe some things you don't know under in development, we've got four big opportunities for new kinds of research and new kinds of uh, technical developments. The first, of course, are these huge text, text bases. Uh, Paul has mentioned the... Um, the Hathi Trust, we're, we're establishing, we have established something called the Stanford Digital Repository. Uh, it's intended to be, as the Hathi Trust is, a, a, a digital archive for both preservation and for access for the products of digitization. You'll see some of the uh, producing entities there in the second bullet. But it's also intended to be an institutional repository for preservation and access for the Stanford um, products, including the, the corporation's own products. So electronic theses and dissertations, tech reports, byproducts and products of, of research at Stanford, uh, and so forth. We're also intending to open this up and make it an enterprise repository for preservation and access. And I say preservation and access because I see these as two separable and importantly separable uh, functions so that we end up with the mother files, the originals, being preserved and presumably migrated or otherwise transformed as uh, new operating systems, new applications, new data formats, and so forth come, come to pass. And we need to, to keep moving those, those mother files to places and uh, formats that can be read and, and used. Um, in addition to the, the, the products of digitization, we are assembling into that repository, and I'm, and I'm guessing that eventually Hathi Trust and others will go there too, those commercial products which we have either licensed or bought that have enabled us to put them into such a repository for long-term use, for long-term preservation, and especially for long-term analysis. I'll come back to the analysis in a bit. We also see 
The e thesis movement uh, coming right along. Uh, we just signed a deal and started transmitting Stanford e theses and dissertations uh, through an approval process uh, at the level of the, the um, supervising faculty member, the department, and the registrar onto the Stanford Digital Repository and from there onto Google for free distribution and uh, free indexing worldwide with possibilities to the authors to limit reading to 20% of the work or to embargo all but the table of contents and abstract information for a period of some time. Uh, of all the dissertations that have been submitted so far, only 20% have taken advantage of the, of the embargo. So it looks like it's going along. You also see it, and partly I have to, I have to claim that with regard to these uh, digit mass digitization efforts that you see listed up there, if it hadn't been for the Google Book Search pro Project, none of these would have come up. The Open Content Alliance was a reaction to Google. The Japanese National Diet Library project, which has about 150 million US dollar equivalent in yen, resulted from the fact of the Google uh, project. Ditto the French, uh, the BNF National Patrimony Project, which is said to be getting on the order of 150 million euros from Sarkozy. We'll see when the check is written, but that's a promise that he made in print. The European Library, European Regia, et cetera, are similar projects that emerge in part because of the Google Book Search project, but also because there are some other smaller projects that reveal what can be done with digitized manuscripts, archives, source materials in general for the use of scholarship, but also for use in supporting national pride. Uh, we are looking for web-based, freely accessible sites that allow us to download content we have worked out a treaty with our general counsel, which prescribes us to move through a, a testing mechanism involving letters to the source. How letters get to a small ville in Uganda where they're supporting a renegade political party, I don't know. But we, if we do this three times, we again have done due diligence and we can present this information and we can store it for analysis and preservation and use in the, uh, in the repository. Then we see the development of these gigantic geospatial databases. There are already a very large number in the astrophysics community. Uh, we see uh, huge ones, lesser known in the oceanographic community, although the uh, BT, BP disaster in uh, the Gulf uh, begins to uh, show some of the, um, of the top 10% of the, the bottom 10% of that iceberg, top 10% of that iceberg, mm -hmm. this is right. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there. Oh. Lots and lots of instrumentation feeding lots and lots of data to lots and lots of databases. And then we have all the spy in the sky images that are, that are used in various settings uh, on the web and around the world. We have commercial files uh, that contribute to this, uh, this collection of source materials. And we have some uh, institutional programs. Indeed, there are some individual programs that Dave Rumsey's um, map collection famously digitized and made available for reuse. The semantic web. Finally, I think we're going to see some progress in this zone. And uh, at this moment, I can point to about 100 million metadata records that are about to go into a, a project from about 15 major libraries from around the world. We have a transcoding company working on this for us for free. And I believe uh, that there will be some um, uh, some demonstration by this big prototype of the use of this sort of discovery environment in an academic setting. Uh, there are lots and lots of uh, small projects uh, around the world to take a look at, and they, I think, show very nicely the opportunity that this sort of discovery environment provides to teaching, learning, and research. And finally, and this is the one I know least about, we have this um, plethora of image collections. Some of them uh, coming from museums and galleries, some of them coming from uh, collectives, some of them coming from uh, individuals, very few, uh, some coming from the pop web world, and some coming from our own very own photos that we deposit in various places on the web. It's a, a complicated world we live in. So for each of these but one, I'm going to talk about some opportunities. And, and these opportunities are meant to reveal the kinds of research I think that will be underway or are in part already underway. Um, 
a project that I worked on in the mid-80s involving uh, Italian lyric poetry of the 16th century was in, exactly involved in trying to understand the creative processes that the poets were involved in in building their poetry. A lot of rhetorical devices expressing relationships among poets, among ideas, among courts, between patrons and poets and so forth. This sort of thing is widely studied in music, somewhat studied in art, and increasingly I think will be studyable, will be researchable in literature. Cross-language influences. How does the prevalence of English as the kind of uh, lingua franca of commerce and in part uh, the scientific world uh, influence other languages? How do words get transferred from one language to another? How do constructions get transferred from one language to another? How can you measure that, uh, that, uh, those effects across time and across uh, cultural boundaries? What are the alterations over time to grammar, syntax, and logic in presentation? How have we measured, really measured, forget Nicholas Cage, how have we really me measured the influences of the World Wide Web and its, uh, its presentation on discourse? and on language. We can now measure the spread of ideas across periods of time by looking at the text and understanding what and how ideas, phrases, words get transposed trans, uh, across, across time and across languages. We're beginning to see the possibilities of text classification research in which we better understand the genres we've been talking about and indeed may find some additional genres in many different languages. Uh, machine translation, already pretty advanced in a lot of places, leads a lot more work. It, uh, it may be that these big text bases offer us some more opportunities for that kind of work. Gender differences in the use of language are going to become uh, more easy to study and challenge. Uh, I think we're going to see the, the development of algorithms for metadata. So we can automatically generate metadata and stop worrying about the heavy in investment that we've been making in very brief metadata records on lots and lots of uh, text objects. We have the possibility of applying a, a host of, well, a small host, 3M, uh, search message and strategies, but these will suggest others. So semantic extraction we know about, associative uh, searching, very powerful inside a language. There are some examples of cross-language associative searching that seem to be very, very useful. And of course, taxonomic indexing and taxonomic searching, tremendously powerful, shown in lots and lots of ways, but functioning principally in a single language. We think, as in the case of number one, the first bullet, that the identification of trends and themes and expressions can be done. Uh, I think there are lots of opportunities for this. Uh, we just need to get those, uh, those sources into a place where we can look at them. The development of fingerprints for very accurate relevance matching, especially in biomedical research, dry research, is going to be very, very productive. I say this working myself on a question of discovering the purposes, the many purposes of human peptides in therapies for rare diseases. You have to develop a dossier of the effects of the peptides. You have to develop a dossier on the rare diseases. You have to match the effects of the peptide to the pathways that are known about the diseases. And when you do that, you begin to see, for example, that there's a peptide that we develop in our own abdomen and in our intestines that is useful in expanding the ability of our alveoli and our lungs to absorb oxygen. It then becomes useful for treating 27 different rare diseases of the lung. But this is a problem because we don't have words for the 40,000 peptides, for all the 40,000 peptides that we, that we build and manufacture in our own bodies. And indeed, we do not have pathways for the 7,000 rare diseases. So, so many diseases that are not even well described in the medical literature, very difficult to, to diagnose. So I see a bunch of really good possibilities for this kind of informatics work uh, arising from these text bases. Graphical navigation comes back again and again in these. Uh, I think this is a big opportunity, 
Now, once again, I was, a, I was very impressed by the visualization uh, presentations at this conference that seem to suggest that some of this is going to be uh, possible. New search engine develop, the development, these are, these are test beds for all kinds of new uh, engines. And then we've got at the bottom the semantic web linked data RDF triples development. I'll come back to that in a, when I talk about the semantic web. But I see this as a, as a new way of developing these RDF triples and linked data relationships at various levels of granularity. The work level, the section level, the chapter level, the uh, paragraph level, uh, the, even the sentence level. So here's some things that we need to do. And in, in this respect, uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of work to be done by computer scientists and by information scientists, information managers. We need to find some ways to normalize text coding across genres, across data formats, across coding systems. We need to select a, a sub, we need to be able to select a subset of a text base on some parameter or other in order to an analyze it more deeply. As we build these uh, tens of millions of, of uh, title level uh, text bases, sorting through them and then selecting a, a subset for analysis is going to become quite important. We need to, we need to find better parsers. Uh, we need to uh, engage in algorithmic limitization. I think some of that's already underway, but we need to do across languages. <clears throat> we need to be able to access the accuracy of OCR and express that in a standard way so people can understand the parameters in which they're working on it in a text base. Lemmatization, the various forms of any verb, run, running, ran, wake, woke, etc. Get to the root word. Uh, we need to have probabilistic thematic modeling tools without tagging. A lot of the um, uh, informatics companies that I know employ squads of people, hundreds of people, tagging small, small subsets of the whole literature in order to find more information more quickly for their clients. It's a bum way to go. We have natural language processing now that's coming up, but among those tools, we don't have one for probabilistic uh, thematic modeling. Very important. Uh, algorithmic de de uh, de development of stemma. How many of you know what a stemma is? Okay, a stemma expresses relationships among variant versions of manuscripts. And by various pieces of evidence in a single manuscript compared to all other manuscripts, you can begin to assemble a family of manuscripts and begin ultimately get back to an error version. At least that's the claim. Uh, this also can be used, by the way, in uh, translations and other variants. And finally, we need to have a way to uh, look at algorithmically, algorithmically look at uh, version comparison of texts, even across languages. Geospatial opportunities, real rapidly because I have very few minutes. Um, integration of data sources, both geospatial data, social scientific data, artistic data, humanistic data, but all that can be displayed and analyzed in different ways, making use of geospatial techniques. Our GIS unit at Stanford is growing. The, the use of it is growing across um, a very large number of the departments uh, that we serve. New uses of georectification and layering. How many know what georectification is? Okay, so let me do that. Um, let's imagine that you have the manuscript maps made by Lewis and Clark, that you have the 1840 map of the U.S., you've got the uh, maps in the succeeding generations, and then you'll begin to have satellite imagery uh, of those same zone of uh, North America. The manuscript map and some of these other maps need to be brought into the same um, um, resolution so that you can more accurately track on the satellite map or on the most recent uh, geotopo map where these guys were and where they went, how fast they went in one day and so forth. This method allows you to do that. Layering allows you to put the georectified maps in a stack and look down through them at various times and in various ways to see what was going on. Integration of data, I'll leave that one. New meds, modes of presentation of findings. We need hardware. The, the uh, Microsoft Surface, I was talking to Lee before, is a great example. I'm almost dead sure that the military has very large ones and that the intelligence agencies have very large ones. We need that to be in the hands of our students and our faculty and our researchers. 
uh, new geo, geo, geospatial techniques for representation. Uh, by this, I mean um, the ability for those who engage in the kinds of virtual representation that we've seen here to develop independent of any actual uh, geographical uh, representation, new views of information topographies. It's, it's not just uh, the charting of that information as we've seen, but also the, a way of expressing relationships among them, relationships in time, size, and whatnot. Uh, applications for navigation of multiple large data sets. Here I'm reminded uh, of the work of the uh, Center for Creative Uses of Music and uh, Center for Creative Applications of Music and Acoustics at Stanford, which developed an acoustic method of scanning a database and discovering the anomalies. It's a big, it's a big topic. I think there's an application here for geospatial data applications. And finally, I list some of the things that came up uh, uh, in part in some of these presentations on visualization. But I want to mention particularly the work of Mark Lavoie digitizing by scanning the Michelangelo David in the Academia de Bellas Artes in uh, Florence. You know there's the famous statue that everybody sees in the uh, uh, Piazza della Signoria outside the Plazzo Vecchio. And then there's the real one that's inside the academy. Well, Mark discovered that the real one in the academy is three, uh, three feet a meter taller than anyone knew. He also discovered by scanning that Michelangelo engaged in the use of a kind of perspective in carving out the statue from the stone that was not an accurate representation of a human body, anybody's human body. And he did this because he had a particular view on how people would look at it. More of that needs to be done. We can compare the predecessors to the David, and we can compare the David to its successors. We have all kinds of new research to be done. This is a very influential statue. It's only one of several. There are lots of different genres. Quite interesting results could uh, obtain. Semantic web. <clears throat> we now live in the world where we have these silos of metadata, silos of content. We've got books and, and library catalogs and uh, publisher catalogs. We've got articles and in uh, silos by publisher mainly, and then we have secondary publishers who bring it into their own zone, do their own work on it. We've got all kinds of silos to cross in order to find the relevant objects, and they're almost always print objects. We need to bring in media objects to this. We need to bring in Java models and other things. And I think it's very difficult, except for professionals in the information searching world, to understand what may be possible to find it and then to deliver it. And in the goal of user self-sufficiency, which is part of what Paul was talking about in his presentation, we need to make it possible for people to cross these genres themselves and to do so easily, reliably, and consistently. I think the semantic web offers that possibility. We need to prove that possibility, but we're headed there. We need to be able to uh, reproduce uh, these searches and the results uh, using definer, user definer uh, parameters. We need to be able to enable cross-lingual, cross-cultural discovery. Uh, we need to be able to relate the taxonomies and ontologies of different disciplines in a standard way so that we can do more interdisciplinary work, better inter interdisciplinary work. It's going to take some effort as described uh, down here in uh, these two zones. Uh, we need to make possible linkages we need to, once again, get involved in some graphical navigation of the RDF triple spaces and stores. We will, of course, enable new mashups. Um, this last one is an interesting one. Uh, there's a lot of focus in the various disciplinary communities on authorized and authenticated people engaging with such systems. I think that's great. But at the same time, I think we need to make it possible for those who are not recognized as authorized or uh, authentic to come in, develop their own RDF triple statements, their own links, and annotate those that exist. Maybe we'll find some new things. Maybe there are cultural differences among us that enable new views of some of this, uh, uh, these underlying uh, information objects or the notions that they represent. OK, forward. Um, here are a bunch of tools that we need to develop. I'm, I'm deeply into this these days, so it's a big, long list. Uh, 
Firstly, and most importantly, we need to have transcoders developed. We need to be able to take MARC records, Dublin Core records, METS records, all kind of headers, and transcode them into multiple different RDF triples. We think that on average from any given metadata uh, record, we're going to see something between 10 and 50 RDF triples developed. Fortunately, they're short. They're not, it's not as though we're saving the whole text. But it shows you the size of what we're up to. And if we can do this transcoding on the fly, as somewhere I down here mentioned, and people can drop their metadata into a transcoder and then pump it out for web searchable results, then suddenly our entire discovery environment becomes much, much different. <clears throat> we need to be able to select and filter these RDF triples, select at the level of, uh, of an intellectual engagement, select at the level of language, region of origin, et cetera, so we can once again reduce the, the end set of a, of a discovery engagement to something that's manageable, not crazy. We need to expand it sometimes too. Graphical representations come back here. This is a great zone for a lot more work. I see that I have no more time, but we're going to make these slides available, right, Lee? Absolutely. Okay, so these will be around. Image files, just briefly. We need to be able to reassemble an artist's oeuvre, put all of Monet, all of Monet, all of Picasso into a file, be able to list that file by region, by relationship, including personal relationships, by method, by style, chronologically. We need to be able to annotate and select from that long list so that we can tell our story. We need to be able to mix images from Picasso with Dada, okay? We need to, we need to be able to expand the possibilities for active comparison of works of art, particularly images. We need to be able to show the nose on the David or the hip on the David and compare it to the larger uh, statue. We need to be able to look at a capital, capital from Clooney, and compare it to a capital from a church in X, AIX that is. Those capitals originated at the same time by different artists. They're informed by the same sensibility of the time. We need to be able to, to prove that or disprove that hypothesis. I've already mentioned number three. Uh, variants are very interesting, and this is an area where image uh, engagement by the CS folks is going to be wildly useful. They need to do it in, in cooperation with information managers and, of course, with art people. Uh, number, the last penultimate one is pretty much obvious, as is the bottom one. Here's some of the more or less generic uh, tools that I think we need to develop here. Again, I'm not an expert in this zone, but uh, I see these uh, as ones that need the attention of some real experts, so we move the whole field along. That's my wrap-up. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> wow, we've got a lot to do. <laughs> I would now like to uh, introduce Jim Mullins from Purdue University. Let me pull your slides up. And uh, Jim is, uh, as mentioned, the university librarian at uh, Purdue University, as well as uh, head of the, uh, um, the university press at Purdue. Jim. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, what do I hold to move the slides? Okay. Well, yesterday, over the last period of days, we've been hearing about the challenges of data. And if I had probably sat down and rewritten my slides, I would have left off some of these because a lot of these things were covered in the last day or so. So some of the points I make here are pretty much self-evident and have been made by the various speakers that we've listened to during the past day. And I want to once again point out, and on the previous slide we talk about the fact that there is a mandate that those people who wish to go to NSF in this fall to uh, apply for a grant are going to need to have a data management plan. And four years ago, I served on a panel um, at NSF where uh, we were asked to look at the issues and the challenges of data. And our recommendation to the NSF at that time was you need to require a data management plan uh, for every grant that comes in. The response was, and if we do that, who's going to look at them and who's going to know whether a data management plan is viable or plausible? And we couldn't answer that question. 
none of us could really say what was a viable or plausible uh, data management plan. So the challenge that we look at in the libraries is if this is a collection, if this is a resource that supports and, and, and augments the scholarly communication of our researchers, how do we become a part of that in the library world? And in the libraries, we had to sit back and think, what is, what is the typical role that a librarian has when they're working with either a collection or working with a researcher? And when I came to, MIT, or to Purdue, I had been at MIT and I came to Purdue, I went out and started talking to the researchers and said, what is your problem? What is your biggest challenge? It wasn't publishing. It was managing their data. They said, we don't know how to manage this data. And I said, you mean putting it into an archive or what? And they said, just knowing what to do with it. I sat down with our IT, the head of our IT, our CIO, and asked him what was his biggest challenge. And he said, all of these researchers coming to me and saying, can I give you my data? And he said, we could take their data, but we wouldn't know what to do with it. And I said, we can help. And, and he said, what do you mean? And I said, that's what librarians do. We organize things. We put structure behind things. And he said, I never realized that. And then he said to me, he said, I feel like the cavalry have arrived, um, that we had been there, we were there to save him. So the data challenges and not. Discovery and retrieval, authentication, curation, attribution, provenance, citation, and impact of data set, archiving, and storage. Um, storage, when I talk to my IT counterpart, he says, we can supply the storage. That's not a problem. Um, we can create that. It's not that expensive as long as we have the power and the cooling to make it work. So don't worry about that. The biggest challenge is how do we get that data in and out? Um, about two weeks ago, we had a conference at Purdue um, that focused on the challenges of e-science. And we had several of the speakers that have spoken here recently speak at that conference. And one of the people that spoke was Arden Bement. Um, he is now at Purdue as director of our Global Research Policy Institute. And Arden just stepped down as the director of the National Science Foundation and was instrumental in getting the requirement uh, from NSF, or that NSF would have the requirement of the data management. So he came up and he's a, he, went to a, he was trained as a mining engineer. At Purdue, he was at Purdue prior to going to NSF. He is a nuclear engineer. And so he still thinks though in the issue of mining. So he said he likes to think of, of data as raw ore, concentrate, and virgin metal. And I had to sit there and think about that using those analogy, thinking what does that really mean? raw ore being the, the data in the broadest sense, all the data coming in from the, the sensors, from the research that's going on, the investigations. Concentrate, one of the great things, I'm not a, I'm not a scientist at all by, tra by training, I'm a humanist, but I've enjoyed learning how the scientific and engineering mind works and how they go through their research process. And I found out that uh, talking to one researcher, she said, oh yeah, I've got raw data. And then that raw data, and hers is water sensing. And she said, and that water sensing data is fine until some uh, weasel gets into the sensor device and throws it all askew. And she said, so I can't use some of that data. I have to clean it up. I have to massage it. So that becomes the concentrate, where they become, the data becomes refined. Then the virgin metal is that data that becomes supportive of a particular research project, a publication. But his big question is, which one is worth saving and which one is worth throwing out? These three publications, I think if you have to go out right now and read about what is going on in the area of data management, these three publications would give you the best summary. Um, the report that was, that's on the top was issued by the, the National Academy of Sciences, uh, co-chaired by two MIT faculty. And it really dealt with the challenges as the scientists were thinking about the research data. The middle one, obviously we've had a mention to that and obviously you can pick it up on a table outside, gives you a very uh, interesting perspective from the corporate, from the perspective of different users and different uh, uh, interest or uh, vested, vested parties. 
And then the last one, keeping research data safe too. Um, couldn't, been, couldn't have been more timely. As all of us are sitting back now to come up with our data management plans, we're trying to assess what are the cost factors that are coming into the managing this data. And at Purdue, we're in the process of doing that like everyone else. And I sent this report to our IT people and said, look at this. This, we, want, we don't want to be invent, reinventing the wheel. This tells us what the problems are and the challenges that we have. Well, one of the ways that um, we have gotten to the point where we can do a fairly consistent identifier for our research has been assigning a digital object identifier. And Crossref uh, was created as a resource or as an organization, institution, to manage this uh, uh, identifying, uh, associating an identifier with published journal articles. On this slide right here, this is an article, and here's the DOI that, that indicates it, identifies it. It's efficient, it's scalable, it's a linking system that works. And the, the researcher can click on that. If the, if the article is in the public domain or in open access, it'll come right up. If a person is sitting at an institution that has access to a database that may have this, this article, it'll come right up. And this is the kind of success that Crossref has already had. Uh, total number of participating institutions, publishers, and societies, 3,108. Um, total number of participating libraries, 1,600. Total number of journals, 22,000. That seems like a lot, but it really isn't. Um, when our, our, our university administrators say, do you really need 60,000 journals? Um, who's reading 60,000 journals? We have to say, oh, that's just a drop in the bucket. There's many more than that. So 22,000 is not a lot. Uh, DOI is deposited, uh, 41 million. Let's see, I'm getting, DOI is registered to date, 41 million. DO, DOI is deposited in the pre previous month, 375,000. And the numbers retrieved 15,247 in the last month. So that shows a direct relationship to productivity and the use of the DOI. So what about data? Um, as part of this conference that we had a couple weeks ago, we had three researchers come and talk about their data how they acquire data, how they use data, how they share data, or how they don't share data. And this is the comment by one of them. Um, she said this facetiously, but I think there was more truth in it than she realized. Because I've mentioned this to other people, and they go, oh yes. Um, Seeing somebody's data is the kind of the underside that you don't really want to show somebody. And uh, so I, I said, well, if it's like showing somebody their, your underwear, um, is there really a chance that we're going to get people comfortable with that? And she said, well, maybe it's not the best analogy. So we'll hope that it isn't. Well, what I'm going to finish talking about is data site. And data site is a global registration agency for research data. Now, remember I mentioned that there was a DOI, the Crossref, was established in order to be able to link DOIs to published articles. But there needed to be the same analogous type of process to link to the data. Uh, so we have um, brought together, about three years ago, there was an announcement um, from Germany that they were starting to do digital object identifiers for data sets. And this is data sites long-term vision. You can read it, so I won't read it to you. And the challenge that we have in libraries, or, and, and sometimes when I say a challenge for libraries, I, I, I want to back up and say it's the challenge for research. It's the challenge for researchers. Sometimes in libraries, we have a tendency to speak specifically about things as they affect us without putting it into the context that this is the whole community that is uh, affected by either things that we can or cannot do. Descriptive metadata, obviously, would be the author, person, or corporate research variables. 
Subject descriptor is a disciplinary taxonomy, and the digital object identifier is persistent identifier. I had another slide here that I overlaid library science terminology because a lot of these terms are really describing library science principles, cataloging, uh, subject headings, and classification. They're really principles of library science. So here we have a DOI that's been assigned for this data set that under connects to the article. So you have the data set connecting to the article. So you'd be able to go back and forth. Presently, the um, DOI or the data site uh, initiative is up and coming. It's growing. It's developing. It's only, it only was formally incorporated last December. Um, and there are presently 800,000 data sets already assigned uh, DOIs in the in, DO, in data site. And these are the members or, member organizations. As I said, this really started out of one person's initiative at the German National Library. Um, and, um, and they were the leaders and they were making presentations. They brought other European libraries along. They brought um, Canada. And then in the US, there are two representatives. And the, the intent is to keep the data site controlled um, so that the assignment of DOIs is uh, done through an authorized assignment process so that there is a consistency and uh, lack of duplication in the assignment of the DOIs. And in the US, we have two data site uh, members. Uh, California Digital Library of the University of California and the Purdue University Libraries. And so what would happen is a person who wants to have their data set um, tagged, assigned a DOI, would contact the California Digital Library or Purdue Libraries and we would assign that data site, uh, the, that DOI. And um, my colleagues from the University of California, CDL, are here too, and they will attest that it's still a work in progress. Um, so don't run out and send us your data sets right, right away. Uh, we'll still, we'll let you know. There's a bigger challenge though. Okay. There's a bigger challenge and that is how do we, and it's not us, it's the scientists, it's the engineers, learn to or accept data as a major component in the research dialogue. It's getting there. Um, we've been having discussions with researchers at Purdue for about five years. And when we first started, they kind of saw data as being this necessary evil that we have to deal with. Now they're starting to understand the contribution that data can make to the overall research process and people working collaboratively, building large databases. But what kind of recognition do they have? What kind of authority do they have in the creation of that data site or that uh, data set? So citation by research undertaken and reported through data site will be possible and we could actually establish an H index for the impact. I know that uh, Michael was arguing that we need to make sure we read every one of the articles, which is in the ideal world true. I sit on the university promotion committee and when you see 200 people coming up for promotion and I have to read all these articles, I'm a little not sure that I could do it. Um, but, um, the, uh, but the chance of coming up with some kind of a, a methodology to be able to assign the impact of a data set could be a, a, a measure of the impact of that researcher in his or her field. And this would, I, I think this would be where we would hope to get to. And as I mentioned, I do serve on the University Promotion Committee. And the discussions are taking place where questions are being raised because our goal is to help research and further research in the fastest manner possible. And if we're not allowing data to be considered as part of that contribution to the research discussion, then we're hindering and not recognizing a very important contribution by many of our faculty. And 
I think it'll come, but it's going to take response, it's going to take a good way to evaluate it, to assess it, and to identify it. And, and probably a few very uh, prominent names of individuals, like more or less getting behind the open access movement, to be able to convey to people the importance of data. So I, I think that it'll come. I've only maybe got five or six more years, and I may not see it in my time. But um, I think it'll come where, in particular disciplines, particular fields, the data will be seen as an important contribution to the research paradigm. And that's it. So I'm ahead of time. Thank you very much, Jim. What I'd like to do now is invite the, the three speakers to, to join us up front here, and then we'll um, open it up to questions from, from the audience. Stand here. Hey, there's a question over there, and then. Did you get a microphone? Oh, he's got the microphone. Thank you. Uh, these uh, data management plans are, are worrying everybody who, who wants to write NSF proposals. And it sounds like we have a, a real solution here. Um, we just um, make the data nice and calibrated and then hand it over to uh, opensite.org and give it a permanent uh, object identifier and then we're done, right? Not quite. Um, it's going to have to be deposited in some, res in some archive, some, some server that has the ability to be searchable, retrievable, and it's going to um, have to have a more or less a stewardship. Someone's going to need to steward that data. This, these are all discussions that we're going through right now at Purdue. We just formed a task force of the CIO, me, as the Dean of Libraries, and we will be reporting to the Vice President for Research, and we're bringing 10 research faculty into the task force to plan this whole process. And what we have to look at is what is the, the ingest model for the data, because the, the data has to be brought in with the proper kind of metadata to be able to identify it. Only then could you then assign a, uh, a DOI to it. You, you would have to have the basic metadata to be able to describe that data set, to be able to make it identifiable and unique. Um, and then ultimately, there has to be a vetting process in the future about what data survives, what data disappears. And, and that's going to require a kind of a, a re redefinition in the library community and the research community about whose role that is. It's not that dissimilar than what librarians have done in the past in, in being the stewards for the collections that have been held in the library. That's more or less what we're seeing is we're developing a stewardship for those collections. We don't want to manage the, the, the servers. As someone told me in the libraries, they said, don't we want to run the servers to you know, really have this in the libraries? And I said, are you kidding? I said, we don't take care of the bricks in the building. We don't take care of the floors. We don't take care of the power in the building for the books. We only care about the, the books. The same thing is true with the digital. We don't want to deal with the, the material that, or the items, the, the hardware that makes it, makes it possible. We only care about what's inside. So it's that delineation of our role that becomes important. But it's, it's um, one of the concerns I have with this re re request or expectation from NSF, NSF is universities are now going to go out Everyone's going to go out trying to reinvent the wheel because everyone's at a different position in a different place of where they are. We've really been discussing this at Purdue for five years, and we're still working through the process uh, because it's not simple. It's not simple at all. So let me add a, a, a slightly contrary point of view. Uh, one big issue is that this is not paid for. And when we brought it up to our dean of research a few months ago and informed her of the uh, NSF uh, requirement soon to be announced for data um, um, management plans. She was very upset, not with us, uh, because we, we believe that we have the technical capacity to absorb these data sets, but the cost of the memory is not uh, attributed anywhere. Is it going to be overhead cost recovery? Well, that's not a good idea. Is it going to be a direct cost of the grant? Mm. Well, that means there'd be somewhat less money for the pursuit of the objects of the grant. So there's, a, there's an issue that to be solved. Secondly, uh, unlike Purdue, uh, uh, we actually do uh, control the servers, and we do uh, 
provide specifications and requirements to staff who do manage those servers and the tape drives and the spinning memory and all the rest of it because we believe ourselves in this in this funny organization that I manage which is uh, kind of a merged library and computing operation uh, in um, the sort of cradle to grave uh, data management um, um, view of how to get this done and uh, how to um, um, authenticate and audit the results of uh, the, the management plans. Um, there was another point I wanted to object to, but <laughs> I forget which it is. <laughs> Paul, do you want to speak? Um, uh, Peter Murray Ross, Cambridge. Uh, first of all, they're great presentations, and I think this uh, shows the vision and the potential. But I have one problem. If I take Michael's vision, I can technically do most of what he's put forward in chemistry. As soon as I start doing it, I will be sued by the publishers and the libraries will be cut off by all the suppliers of digital material. So coming back to your presentations, when are universities and their libraries going to have enough collective action and courage to actually take ownership of their own scholarly material uh, and make it available for the rest of the community. We as individuals can do various things to try and liberate it, and we are doing, but we need that vision from the university sector as a whole uh, to take it on board, actually as a major, uh, you know, essentially strategic campaign and win this once and for all. Uh, let me respond first, and then Paul has, I know, a few words to say. First of all, everything that I was talking about taking into our uh, uh, digital archive for access and preservation referred to either materials that we were licensed to hold or we created ourselves. We're having very good luck with practically every publisher except the American Chemical Society with regard to... <laughs> and, and I have I've broken many teeth and heads on uh, uh, of my several heads uh, at the ACS trying to get them to become part of this world, but they're a whole lot more like Elsevier than they are like the Modern Language Association, mm -hmm. gotta confess. Uh, I think the other big problem that we have, and it's one that's uh, very, very common, almost universal in the research library world, uh, anywhere in the major research centers of the world, is the too easy acceptance of the Elsevier, et cetera, deals, and too little selection of the relevant titles. We have too many bottom-feeding journals, too many bottom-feeding publishers, and it's the economic muscle of the libraries who are, in effect, the purchasing agents for the academy to change that. Because they went into the deals too easily to begin with, they end up in a position of lesser influence than the academy deserves. The open, the open access movement, alas, only has adherence among 10% or so of the, of the uh, publishing researchers, and I'm not convinced it's the only and the best way. I think there are actually responsible publishers doing very necessary work. It's not free, it does have to be paid for, and there is a, no open access model that is absolutely and totally free. Somewhere the money has to come, and frankly, I believe in professional publishing. So there's an issue there. But I think it's in part up to the members of the professional societies, such as the ACS, to try to exert influence on their publishing houses, even though they have authorized them and, and enabled them to become Elsevier replicas. to have the permission to use, I want to be able to use it without having to, uh, you know, seek permission from people. And that's something which I think is fundamental uh, to the whole of our future. Agreed. So just, uh, just uh, I agree with most of what Mike said, uh, including the fact that ACS is, is really sui generis. It's really the most special of all of the special uh, society publishers um, in acting um, to exploit all the monopoly power it can get. Very, very well-run organization you got there, but it's not on your side. Um, so, um, so the the reason I wanted, I was happy to be able to speak to this group. I think that this is a classic case of we've met the enemy and they are us. Uh, and so, so actually, individual faculty, groups of faculty, should be beating on their provost's heads, saying, please, 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 
um, use the work for hire doctrine and take from me my exclusive right to sign away the copyright to works that I do at your expense because I just misuse it because I'm an idiot. I'm just a faculty member you know, writing good papers and, and I don't think about that stuff. But if you don't let me do it, if you tie me to the mast here, then in fact we can be in a position where the academy as a whole is in a much stronger bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis these other, these, uh, uh, these publishers. I too agree that publishers add value and their average costs absolutely have to be covered, but they should not be able to exploit monopoly power, especially monopolies that are generated because we work very hard, um, uh, that then get taken from back away from the academic sector. So by all means, let's figure out ways to cover average cost. I really do think that faculties need to insist that this is an important issue, and by and large, they haven't, and there are, we can imagine executing licenses of the kind that I've talked about. Um, there are pieces, a piece of legislation sitting in front of Congress, sort of at the moment, called FERPA, which would require that federally funded research after a year, a year after publication, would be made publicly, uh, publicly available and reusable in just the way that you're talking about, and I think that reuse is, is crucial. We could get behind that and say, this is good for science, um, uh, even though it may not be good for the business models of some particular scientific societies. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what you've said, Paul, and I use a, one of your, I think from the Michigan, where you, I think you canceled 27,000 journal subscriptions a few years ago because of budget cut, because of the budgets of, of your library had not gone up as fast as the journal subscriptions. The, the best behavior actually was Mike here, who never, never did the big deals. But no, I, I, absolutely, I absolutely, if I want to, a paper on we salmon, I have here. to buy a deal where I get papers on sardines and pilchards and all this stuff I don't want. I, I, I agree. Uh, so I do think there's a responsibility on the librarians. And the only thing, so as Dean of Engineering, my faculty didn't, wasn't aware there was a crisis. And that's the problem. So you say only 10% supported. But that's because they don't know there's a problem, all right? Because they can publish in the journals they want. And that there is a responsibility to get the message out there. And uh, one of the things I disagree with my librarian, who I liked very much, and on many things he was very sensible, but on this he wanted lots more shelving space. I don't actually see any need for 100 libraries in America all to have back issues of phys rev and chemical review and all. You need a few major libraries. And actually, we've got three of them sitting in front of us. I think you need to get together and show a lead of how we do this. And uh, absolutely, we shouldn't be signing over copyright. We should give them right to publish. We should be able to use our, our data. It's done by the people. But our taxes are paid for the reviewing. Our taxes are paid for the research. You know, uh, And Elsevier have a responsibility to their shareholders to generate profits. And you know, 30% profit is coming out of the academic budget. And I have to say, I think it's in your court. But there's a naivete among the faculty that um, never ceases to amaze me. Um, I would go around and talk to the various departments. And one department head I was meeting with, um, I was telling him about the challenge we have with the 7 and 8% inflation every year. And, and he said, well, what is this? And I said, well, it's the, pri the commercial sector, commercial journals. And he said, well, my journal's uh, published by my society. And I said, which one is that? And he told me, and I said, oh, that's an a, a, a proprietary journal. I won't say the name. And, uh, and, and he said, what do you mean? And I said, this publisher publishes it for your society, but it is a commercial vendor. And, and he said, Does, do people own stock in that company? And I said, yes, it's a, it's a stock-owned company. People are making money off of your research. And he said, off of my reviewing? And I said, yes. And it was like a revelation. And, and it's because basically they don't have to think about it. And it's only when, and at Purdue we had not had a budget cut in 15 years. We had not had to do a review of any of our journals in 15 years. And so everybody was complacent. We had everything that people wanted. And it was only last year when we had to do a review that all of a sudden things started, questions started coming up because they were complacent. And, uh, and that's, I think, the challenge is, is when there isn't this um, uh, need to be informed about what the options or the problems really are. So, uh, what I meant to say is that I think a lot of money is locked up unnecessarily in these subscriptions. Uh, and that could be used 
to do the data problems because it does cost money, but there is a responsibility, I think, for, for doing something like data site and things like this. And there is money in the system. It's just locked up in different ways, and there needs to be change. Yeah, uh, and of course, the contractual relationships are part of the problem. So two, just two quick comments. One, the 30% is an understatement. That's the profit after having paid lobbyists and marketers and all kinds of other creditors that you actually wouldn't need if you were just doing this on behalf of the academic sector. So the real number might be 50 uh, rather than 30. Um, and so I guess that, that, and the other is, I think that we're very happy about the idea that we would share collections. Um, there's still some grumbling, um, uh, Provosts occasionally, who haven't thought about it, like to count numbers of volumes. Librarians occasionally like to count number of volumes as well. But I think a shared set of shared print repositories and shared digital um, repositories, such as the Hadi Trust and the other ones that Mike was talking about, that's very much the direction that libraries now want to head. Not all of them, but enough of the big ones, so I think it's really doable. And there's a lot of money to be saved by doing that. Other questions or comments? Thank you. Um, you were talking about, all of you, uh, the value of data and so on, and I'm interested in curation. So that requires experts to testify to the accuracy or the value of a given document or a data set. And, and this is very expensive and time consuming. So how would you see uh, our kind of cutting this cost? What kind of tools could or might be developed to help curators? This is one of those instances where a word to one group does not mean the same thing to the word in another group. Uh -huh. um, when we went out, I started going out talking to the researchers, and I said, we can curate your data. Mm -hmm. And they would say, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. And I say, oh, yes, we can. And they go, no, you can't. It took us a while before we figured out we weren't saying the same thing about curation. They were saying exactly what you did and that is to validate, to substantiate the, uh, the accuracy of the data, which of course in the libraries that would be impossible for us to do. What we refer to curation means providing the proper environment to store it, to carry it into the future. And uh, when we curate a collection, that's what we're doing, is we're making sure that collection is properly housed, properly accessed, and then preparing it to go into the future. So we actually had to sit down with a linguist on campus and understand how we could talk across different platforms. Metadata was another one. Computer scientists had a different definition for metadata than we did. So we had to understand how to communicate and curation is one of them. To get to your point, that's where we look at a proxy serving for a community. That a community would identify a specific institution. Let's say Purdue took on aeronautical engineering. We may have then a collection of people at Purdue who are experts in curating data in aeronautical engineering, and we become the authorities in that. Stanford, Michigan, uh, Ohio State, they become specialists in other data. It's really kind of approximating what's happened in libraries over the years. Our special collections are special uh, collections that represent an, a, a collection that no one else owns. The same thing needs to happen with data, too. That's the only way we're going to survive because of the financial aspects. Let me respond in a different fashion. Uh, presently, we select, we being the 35 subject curators who are qualified by uh, education and experience, uh, we collect materials for uh, long-term mm -hmm. preservation and access in our stacks and in our digital libraries and our digital archives. Mm -hmm. I think if we have at Stanford uh, the service to the those who create data sets in any discipline, the opportunity to deposit their data set, the requirement for the, for, the perf, for the perfection or the authentication of that data set has to lie with the depositor, in effect the publisher. And I don't think we have to deselect over time, as a matter of fact. Our experience at Highwire shows that if we can pay for the memory needed to store the content as it is, in effect, published, as it is deposited, then the flow of material and the resolute decline in cost of storage over the years enables us to store that material for a very long time uh, indeed without new money. 
So I, my position is that if a faculty member at Stanford decides they want to deposit their material, whether it's perfect or imperfect, much as their articles and books are perfect or imperfect, subject to interpretation and so forth, fine with me, we'll take care of it, and given support somehow for that process of ingestion, memory and so forth, over the long run of time, uh, we will make sure that it's accessible. And ideally, we'll be involved in a federation of repositories. Perhaps they're uh, organized by subject, I rather doubt that's going to happen, or only happen in part. Perhaps they're identified by different methodologies of digital preservation and archiving. Perhaps they're in the cloud, perhaps they're in several different countries. But I think some kind of federation, so we have about a dozen copies of any data set uh, somewhere, uh, hedging against failure is where we're headed. Okay, well, I think uh, we're at time. I we've got a few more questions out here, but I think we probably should go ahead and wrap it up and let folks go on to their break and, and move on to the next sessions. But please join me in thanking uh, our three speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you.